Uh, this is a man that needs no introduction. I guess I'm on then. <laughs> okay. So, you guys are here because you're curious about what the hell US visit is. Um, How about now? <laughs> okay. US visit is um, Homeland Security's system for tracking visitors to the United States. Why should you care about it? Why, why is any of this worthy of a DEF CON presentation? Well, let me start with a, a quick show of hands here. How many people in this room um, do not have American passports? Raise your hand if you don't have an American passport. Okay. Keep your hand up if, when you entered the United States, you filled out the green visa waiver form. Okay. Keep your hand up if that lower portion of that green visa waiver form is either in or with your passport. Okay, everyone with their hands in the air, you have RFID tags in your passports. At least if you don't, Homeland Security has stated that they will be deploying home, um, RFID into your passports as soon as they've got the money to actually buy the chips. That's why you need to care. Um, in addition to RFID tags, there is massive biometric data harvesting, massive distribution of this data. Um, I'll be getting on to exactly how. Um, Homeland Security appears to be using cryptographic algorithms that are not NIST approved. So in addition to collecting all of this data, they're not actually handling it properly. Um, and has anyone ever seen one of these before? This is the receipt that you get when you're on the US visit program and you leave the United States. This is an entirely new biometric form of ID that Homeland Security have introduced. Now, that's how it affects foreigners. How does US visit affect US nationals? Well, the first thing is, a lot of these technologies have already been tried to be deployed in um, American passports on, against American citizens. RFID tags and passports in particular. Um, there was a, a, a big uproar not so long ago when um, Homeland Security announced that they would be adding RFID tags to US passports. Such a big uproar that they eventually changed the system so that uh, the covers of the passports now include foil to supposedly shield the RFID tag so that you can't read it unless the passport's open. Unfortunately, Homeland Security can quite honestly currently turn around and say, well, We've been deploying all of this technology to foreigners for a couple years now. We've not had any problems. Why should we not deploy it to everyone else in the world? So foreigners should care because you're directly being affected by this. US nationals should care because you, Homeland Security is setting a precedent here. You are going to be hit with this technology sooner or later unless we can convince Homeland Security that it's actually a bad idea. So let me establish some credibility here. Um, I uh, married my lovely wife a couple of years ago. She's an American citizen. And um, it's taken me three years to obtain my green card. I know a fair amount about the US immigration system. Um, combined with 20 or more trips to the USA coming under this US visit system, and the fact that, hey, I'm a geek, I'm curious, means that I've been able to find out some stuff about it. The only public documentation that I've been able to locate has been one document from Homeland Security with a privacy statement. It's very vague, it's very woolly, there's a whole lot of stuff that's missing from it that should be, but you can combine that with a whole lot of stuff that you can gain from interacting with the system and interacting with these barcodes, and uh, you can figure out quite a lot about it. So that's where a lot of my information comes from anyway. You can visit this on the website if it's at all interesting to you. It's, it's a fascinating read. It's about a 40-page document of which over half is just references. Not a whole lot of information there. So what is it? Um, well, from this privacy document from Homeland Security, um, this is what Homeland Security claims um, US Visit is supposed to do. Personally, I don't see how it actually achieves any of those goals. 
I don't see how adding an RFID tag to someone's passport enhances their privacy. Um, is it just me, or is it actually doing completely the opposite if you can spot a foreigner from 10 meters away? In reality, what happens, large-scale data harvesting, data mining, tracking of foreigners. Um, if anyone's ever come through the Canadian border, you may have seen there's uh, large white sensors um, in all of the various lanes for the cars. Those are RFID tag readers. There's like seven or eight in each lane, and they're just harvesting data as you're going through the border. Um, the upshot of it all is that your personal privacy gets screwed over. So this is US Visit. Um, I'm not going to explain the architecture of it in detail because you don't need to know it. Um, what you do need to know is that there are a colossal number of databases involved. There's a colossal number of systems. US Visit is a system of systems. Many of these are not actually owned by Homeland Security. So a lot of the links between the different components, you have no idea whether or not they're secure. You have no idea how data is being transmitted between them. You have no idea what protections have been put in place to protect your data as it flows around these systems. It's very big, it's very complex, and as far as I'm aware, no one has ever done any security assessment of it. Probably internally in the government, but hey, how good are they? So, how does US Visit work? Well, you come in on the plane, you fill out your I-94 form. This is the, the, the long green visa waiver form. When you sign that form, if you've ever read the, the back of the form, you're actually signing away your right to appeal. So, if you disagree with any of the things that uh, your data will be used for, if you disagree with any decisions that are made based on your data, you have no right of appeal. The guy at the desk, at the, the immigration line that, that takes your fingerprints, he is the authority. You don't even have the right to ask to see his supervisor. His decision goes and you have signed away all rights that you have. If you do not accept each and every one of the terms of the I-94, you do not get into the United States. It's as simple as that. So you get to the immigration line. The guy takes two fingerprints uh, and a digital photo. The information is stored in, an, in the IDENT system for later use. This is a, a component of uh, US Visit. Um, in parallel to this, um, your finger scans are actually sent to IAFIS as well. So you're automatically compared against the FBI's IAFIS database to see if you, know, you have a criminal record or anything. Finally, assuming that you've passed the criminal check, um, the guy should normally staple part of the I-94 form into your passport. And nowhere does it actually mention that there's an RFID tag in it. So informed consent just simply does not exist in this situation. So, when you leave the United States, um, you check in at the airport, you take the, 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 the check-in agent should remove the, uh, the remainder of the I-94 from your passport. They're then legally obligated to notify Homeland Security that you've left the country. So that's your, that's your departure record. Fortunately, it means there's no RFID tag left in your passport anymore. This is a good thing. You clear security and you end up at a number of machines that look like ATMs, but you swipe your passport through them, they take a digital photo, two more finger scans, and they print out one of these receipts. Now, at no point during that check do they actually validate that the person who is getting scanned by the system is the person that actually owns the passport. So there is no correlation between this receipt and me. There's no, no guarantee that, that uh, you know, I haven't faked a fingerprint or whatever. There's no security guards around a lot of the time. So as a form of ID, it's, it's kind of useless. Um, I'll get into more detail about the barcodes later, but um, suffice it to say that this is the only form of ID that will actually get you onto a plane. Homeland Security is absolutely entitled to conduct secondary screening um, at the gate just before you get onto the plane and they will check your fingerprints as they, as they are scanned right there and then against this receipt. If they don't match, you don't get on the plane. It's as simple as that. So what's with these RFID tags then? Well, the, the text in italics here comes directly from Homeland Security's privacy statement. They will provide the capability to automatically, passively, and remotely 
record the entry and exit of covered individuals using RFID, and they're not encrypted, and they could be subject to interception. Homeland Security admits it, accepts it, doesn't care. Um, when the subject of RFID and passports was discussed um, not so long ago, this is what Bruce Schneier had to say about it, and I completely agree with him. It is a clear threat to privacy, personal safety, and it's a bad idea. Doesn't stop Homeland Security from doing it, though. As foreigners in the United States, you have very few rights, in this situation at least. So the biometrics, um, two fingerprints, digital photo. Um, fingerprints are relatively easy to fake. It's been known for a while that uh, you can melt down some gummy bears. Um, you can take someone's fingerprint, print it onto a transparency, um, etch it into a, a PCB and use that as a mold for a section of gelatin, which you can then just paste over your finger. They can be faked really easily. Um, considering how easy it is to get hold of someone's fingerprints, and I'll show you some more examples in a few minutes, um, it's pretty bad. Now, the way that the fingerprints are actually stored, they're not stored as pictures. So you can't just decode one of these things and recover someone's fingerprint directly. It's stored as minutiae. Now, a minutia, if you examine the ridges on your finger, a minutia is where a line, is where a ridge either splits, stops, or breaks. There's a few other classes, but those are the main ones. So your actual fingerprint is stored as a series of XY coordinates with the type of minutia and the direction of the minutia, such as the, the direction that the ridge continues on. Now, from that information, it's possible to reconstruct the fingerprint. It may not necessarily be the same fingerprint, but as long as it has the same minutia in the same places, it counts as the same fingerprint. You don't need very many points of correlation, and it's, it's fairly easy to do. It, it can absolutely be done. Now, I mentioned that when you get your fingerprints taken, it's automatically compared against IAFIS. I'm not a lawyer here, but uh, over here you have the Fourth Amendment, which says that you can't search someone without due process. I'm not aware of walking through immigration as you know, sufficient justification to be able to do a criminal background check on me. But because you signed the I-94, you've consented to it. Fourth Amendment doesn't really apply because you've explicitly signed for consent. The digital photo that's taken, it's in the form of a low resolution photograph according to Homeland Security. In the days of 10, 12 megapixel digital cameras, who knows what Homeland Security classes as low resolution? I have no idea. Um, I have no idea what the specifications are of that picture. I don't know if we can ever find out. So all of this information is printed onto these receipts. So, what is it? Well, it's a high-resolution, two-dimensional barcode. It's roughly 200 pixels by 100 pixels, so there's about 20 kilobits of data on it. Um, about 25% of the data on this is error correction information, so it's entirely possible to, to lose large chunks of the barcode if it gets folded or torn or whatever, and still scan it. It's very robust, it's very reliable. Um, the actual symbology used is called Aztec code. The, 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 the barcode standard is Aztec. Um, it's an open standard. Um, it's not very common, but you can pick up readers on eBay. Um, I got this with change from 100 bucks. Um, there is also absolutely the possibility of using a smartphone to, to recognize these barcodes. Um, I have software on my smartphone that will recognize other two-dimensional symbologies of similar data density. It's, it's very easy to do. Um, so you could gather these things in a lot of different ways. The information on the barcode consists of both of your fingerprints, all of the information on your passport. There's a, a little bit more information printed at the top. Um, your digital photo, the whole lot, all of it is on this barcode, ready to be retrieved. Supposedly, it's encrypted. Um, if you, I'll show you a plot of the data in a second that uh, supports the theory that it at least looks random. But uh, you can deduce some information about the encryption algorithm used if you look at the block size. Cryptographic algorithms work on fixed size blocks of data. So if you've got a, um, a series of chunks of data that align on 64-bit boundaries, you can use that information to take a guess at what algorithm is in use. With these, I actually have a couple of these, and the, 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 the block size appears to be 16-bit, which is inconsistent with DES, 
AES, any of the really good algorithms. It's possible that it could just be a direct RSA cipher. I doubt it. Um, it's possible that it could be a stream cipher, such as RC4. Um, if it is a stream cipher, such as RC4, RC4 is not NIST approved, so Homeland Security should absolutely not be using it. Um, quite what the algorithm is, I have no idea, but it's certainly not AES. So if you actually take a, a few of these, this is a, a plot of, of four of these barcodes. So you scan these into a PC and you just get a binary blob of data. If you count how many times each byte appears, it's a good, a good way to take a guess as to whether or not something is actually random. So at the bottom here, you've got four individual barcodes and the frequency of each byte on each barcode. And then at the top, you've got the total. Um, there are some mild inconsistencies. There's a spike around 50. Um, I investigated it, and it's nothing. Um, there's no particular byte sequences in it. There's an unusually high occurrence of 0D, 0A, um, but it's not consistent across all of the barcodes. So again, you can't really do, deduce anything from it. Um, it looks random. It looks encrypted, but looks can be deceiving. It may not be encrypted at all. So to scan the image, you grab your barcode scanner. It's that quick. And I've now got all of the information on this barcode. There is actually two barcodes on here, um, right next to each other, so it looks like one. But you can scan the second one just as quickly. Homeland Security reckons that the encryption codes used for these are changed daily. Now, if they are changing the codes daily, then it means that they have to have some kind of key distribution system. And something that people are doing every day for years at a time, there's going to be mistakes made. There's going to be weaknesses in the key distribution systems. There's going to be ways to retrieve the keys directly from the system. Um, I believe that at the moment they're transmitted over Wi-Fi networks. So you can sniff the keys out of the air. They're probably encrypted over some kind of communications channel. But again, who knows? I don't really want us to be uh, caught by security sitting in an airport sniffing traffic off the uh, US visit network. So <laughs> the other thing about them is that even if they are changing the codes daily, um, it doesn't really matter because you can legitimately take a flight through an airport and you can just harvest some of these codes. Um, if you break the encryption key on one, if you particularly target one barcode and you retrieve the key, then you retrieve the key for all of the barcodes for that day. So you can just spend a day in the airport harvesting codes and decrypt it all once you break a single key. It's trivial to harvest these things. Um, walking around an airport with a barcode scanner hooked into a laptop in your backpack, kind of a little bit suspicious. Um, Certainly taking pictures of people with camera phones isn't as suspicious. Dumpster diving for these receipts, who's honestly going to care? People don't know what information is on these. So you get situations like this. Um, some guy published one of these on Google Images. Now, this looks like a fairly low quality image. But the fact is, there is so much error correction data in these that that barcode could probably be recognized. With a little bit of image cleanup, with a little bit of, of processing and, and uh, edge detection, you could probably scan that barcode and you could probably retrieve that guy's fingerprints, digital photo, passport information, name, date of birth, flight information, the whole lot. Now, if he had known what was on this, do you honestly think he would have put it on Google Images? I don't think so. So the upshot of all of this is that these things constitute an entirely new form of ID. It's biometric information. It can be compared at any point during the, uh, your, your flight. Um, on entry, on exit, it can be checked. People don't actually understand that it's a form of ID, though. So people don't treat it with the respect that it deserves as a form of ID that contains a copy of my fingerprints. It's, it's ridiculous that there is no information telling people what these things are. The first time I retrieved one of these from the machine, I didn't know what it was. I saw it was a big 2D barcode and I thought, hey, it'd be great to get a scanner for that and see what's in it. But then never thought about it again. People don't know, so they don't 
understand the precautions that you have to take to protect this information. The other thing is, yes, it is a form of ID, but all it does is it verifies that the individual boarding at the gate is the same individual who completed the exit process at the kiosk. So all it proves is that the person who scanned their fingerprints at the machine, at the ATM box, um, is the same individual that's in front of them now. It does not guarantee that it's the same person who owns the passport. It does not guarantee that you're supposed to be there. As a form of ID, it is utterly, utterly useless. But at the same time, it's the only thing that will get you onto a plane. So let's look at uh, data retention policies and who can access this. This is a, a section from um, Homeland Security's privacy assessment where there's some very interesting things in here. Um, the data that they retrieve can be subpoenaed. Um, file a civil lawsuit against someone, you can apply to Homeland Security to retrieve all of their US visit data because they explicitly state that it will be made available in civil lawsuits. Foreign agencies, law enforcement or otherwise, I don't know, you know, which countries they'd share this with, which ones they wouldn't, which classes of law enforcement they would share it with. As far as this statement indicates, they'll share it with anyone who is lawfully engaged in collecting law enforcement information. Now to me, this strikes me as, as deliberately vague. This seems like Homeland Security just saying, hey, we'll give it to anyone. If you can at least make a decent case that you're lawfully engaged in collecting this information, yeah, we'll give you as much as you like. I'm not happy with my data being given out in that manner. I don't think, I don't think many people in this room would be. Along similar lines to this is the green cards. I recently obtained my own green card. And on the back is a rather nice shiny surface. This is actually a CD. What a CD does in a circle, this does in a straight line. Um, fortunately, along the very bottom of the, section, of the, the data section, um, they print the patent numbers. Gotta love the USPTO, because it's all open, it's all completely public, you can just retrieve the patents. You can track down the manufacturer, you can obtain readers, you can obtain more cards, you can do whatever you like. And according to the patent, the absolute minimum amount of data that you can fit on one of these is 250 kilobits. According to the manufacturer's website, this card contains 2.8 megabytes of data. I have no idea what is on this. I suspect that it is a complete copy of every form that I filled out in order to receive my green card. I would not be surprised if that's the case. 2.8 megs was certainly in the right ballpark. Um, unfortunately, the readers for it are rather pricey. You can't really pick them up on eBay. It's heavily patented, it's heavily controlled, it's very, very pricey. Um, I've seen estimates of $50,000 for the readers. So I'm not gonna be getting my hands on one anytime soon and uh, I doubt I'll be able to build one. So who knows? So what's the big deal with all of this? Why, why is this an issue? The whole point is that US Visit is setting precedents. Homeland Security is, is using this to establish these technologies, to deploy these technologies in real world scenarios so that they can then go back to the lawmakers and they can say, hey, we've been putting RFID tags and passports for years. We've had forms of ID that include biometrics, that include large quantities of data, that include fingerprints on the front of the card. So whenever anyone takes a copy of this, as is fairly standard practice when you use it as a form of ID, that person then has my fingerprint. Homeland Security can quite legitimately turn around and say, we've been doing this for years, we've never had a problem, why should we care about deploying it to everyone else in the United States? US, barcode, US driving licenses already have large barcodes on the back. Um, large two-dimensional barcodes. These are different symbology. Uh, the symbology that they use is PDF 417, which is a absolutely common um, symbology. You can pick up readers absolutely anywhere for these barcodes. Um, there's, there's two different types of barcodes on the back of a US driving license that I've seen. There's a small barcode about, about half an inch thick. That just contains a machine readable version of the front of the passport, of the, the front of the driving license. 
There is a much larger version that's about three times the size. Um, I have no idea what's on it because none of my American friends will let me scan it. So could be anything. I suspect it's a digital photo, but uh, if any volunteers would like me to uh, scan their driving licenses and find out, come talk to me. Where's it all going to end? Where is all of this going? You can already spot a foreign passport from 10 meters away with an RFID tag reader. You can pick out bars where foreigners like to hang out. Foreigners generally tend to carry their passports with them in the United States in a lot of situations. Probably DEF CON is the exception to that. Um, but certainly, it's, it's a very easy form of ID for a foreigner in the United States. A lot of um, you know, bouncers at clubs don't actually know how to understand a foreign driving license or a foreign ID card. So a passport is the easiest form of ID, and you can spot them from a, a reasonable distance away using a high-gain RFID antenna. The major point about this, though, is that there is no informed consent. People are forced to sign up for this not knowing what is involved, not knowing what is going to happen with their data, not really understanding what is going on with this system, not having any clue um, you know, where their data is going to go, who it's going to be shared with, where it's going to end up, how it's going to be destroyed. None of these questions are answered. And the simple fact is, unless you agree to everything that Homeland Security ever wants to do with your data, you don't get into the United States. It is as simple as that. And I don't know about you, but I think that's wrong. I think that Homeland Security needs to, to address this. They need to figure out exactly which bits of the US visit system are actually worthwhile, because certainly these things aren't. These, thing, these receipts present an unacceptable risk to personal privacy, and they don't actually serve any purpose. So why is it being deployed? The only answer can be to set a precedent for American deployment. Now, I know I've got a fair amount of time left, so um, deliberately so, because I wanted to get some questions going. Anyone? Question? Over here. I believe they are. I believe IDENT matches them. Um, it, uh, matches it against your passport number. So every time you enter the United States, it automatically compares it against the previous visits. So if you turn up in the United States on a completely new passport with a completely new set of fingerprints, they've got nothing to match it against. But it should be compared against previous versions, yes. Yep. <laughs> I have considered microwaving my green card. Um, gentleman was asking if uh, I've ever considered microwaving my green card. Um, yes, I have, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how useful it would be afterwards. It's just a piece of plastic, so I wouldn't want to melt it. So much effort to, to get hold of the thing. It's also a federal offense for me to not have it with me at all time. If I'm ever stopped by a police officer and I don't have my green card with me, that is a felony. It's great. I'm sorry? Oh, is that really the case? OK. I was actually advised that it was at any time I was stopped by a police officer. Oh, I, shall, I shall look into that and find out the proper answer. Yep. The um, European Court a few weeks ago decided that um, the agreement under which the EU supplies passenger information data to the um, US DHS is actually illegal under EU data protection law. How do you think that one's going to play out? The actual illegal component of it is, I believe, the Americans' demand for it. If the individual states elect to submit that information to Homeland Security, um, I believe it's, uh, it's still legal. Obviously, if you also get the consent of the passengers involved, again, it becomes legal. So it's all a question of um, whether you actually sign away your rights to this. So it may well be the case that uh, the actual process is illegal on its own, but once you obtain the consent of the people involved in the process, it stops becoming illegal. So 
as far as I'm aware, Homeland Security has not been affected by this in any way. They're going to carry on doing exactly what they have been doing. Any more? Oh, in the red. I'm sorry? No, I'm, I'm absolutely not aware of any U.S. Visit success stories. Um, U.S. Visit was introduced in full stealth. Um, there was no real warning of its deployment. Um, it just appeared at airports one day. Um, it's been very much taken under the radar. There's been no real numbers published about success or failure of the system. There's been no information about APHIS hits, nothing at all. As far as I'm aware, the, there has been no successes. So, no is the simple answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sasan? On the success thing, I have actually read a bit. They do have some numbers where they claim to have identified, you know, X number of criminals leaving the country. There are a bunch of GAO reports talking about U.S. visit, auditing it. And Basically, in those reports, they also say that the program is horribly mismanaged and pretty much inept. And I'm wondering what you think about that beyond the nefarious you know, aims that the government might have. What about the fact that it's just really inept? Well, as I mentioned in the, um, if you go back to the architecture diagram, um, a system this large and this complicated, it's extremely difficult to manage. Um, it's not like um, a, a large banking back end where everything has been designed from the ground up. The system has very much been a, a case of Homeland Security setting some goals and then just pulling in components from completely different agencies in order to, to build a system that kind of works. So. As far as the ineptness goes, I think it's just inherent in the way that the system was designed and constructed. It was just kind of thrown together to solve a problem, which is why it's such a failure. I'm sorry, front corner. Into what, sorry? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, some of these systems are owned by CIA, some are owned by FBI. NSA is distinctly missing from this. Um, conspicuously so. So I would not be surprised at all if this architecture diagram was missing a couple nodes that are managed by NSA. Who knows? We, we may never find out. Um, I'm certainly not. I, I don't have the resources to, to fight a Freedom of Information Act case, so we may never find out. As far as screening the RFID tags goes, yes, absolutely. Um, the problem is that um, at the moment that will work because Homeland Security is still deploying the RFID tags into the, 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 the I-94 forms. Some do have them, some don't have them. Certainly if you come if you enter the United States by land or by sea, it should have an RFID tag in it, and they're deploying it to air, tra air passengers at the moment. Um, so at the moment, if you get an I-94 without the RFID tag in, then yes, it will still be recognized. In the longer term, they're going to be basing the I-94 system off the RFID tag directly. So you'll have the choice of either queuing up in a very long line to, to for manual processing, or just walking through the gate, getting your RFID scanned, and just clearing security. Yes? Um, to answer the question about success stories, it's interesting. There's, there's one real big one, actually. They picked up a guy in Afghanistan. I think his name was Kamzi. This was in the New York Times a couple years ago. But um, he was picked up. He wasn't talking. He was taken off the Gitmo or something like that. And they finally ran his fingerprints uh, against the IDENT database. And it turns out that he showed up at the Florida airport, um, didn't have any good information on where he was staying or who he was staying with, so they kicked him out of the country, but they took his fingerprints. 
And so they went back to their records. When they, when they ran his fingerprints, they identified him as this guy. And they looked at the security camera videos. And sure enough, a uh, rental car registered to Mohammed Atta uh, was, drove through the airport to pick him up that day. He was the 20th hijacker. It wasn't, you know, Musawi or anything like that. Um, that's the, but, <laughs> granted, that's the one good success story they've had, uh, you know, to counter terrorism. Um, the, the other, the, I also had a question. Um, uh, what's the source on them running the fingerprint data against IAFIS, the FBI database? It's in their privacy statement. It's not directly listed, um, but they do say that they will compare against federal and state fingerprint databases. And later on in the document, they, they have a, a section on acronyms, and they mention IAFIS in the acronym section. So I believe what they did is they originally mentioned that in the document, but then later redacted it and left the acronym in there. So they do mention that they compare against federal and state fingerprint databases. IAFIS is in the acronyms. Because I would imagine you can work mean, it out. computationally that's extraordinarily hard to take all the visitors and compare them against all the people on IAFIS. So, uh, well, the whole point about fingerprint matching based on minutia is that it stops being about image recognition and it starts being about geometry. Because um, with um, with the, the, the fingerprint reduced to a set of minutia, you've just got a set of coordinates. Mm -hmm. And you just need to figure out whether the points that you have and the points that you're comparing against have the same coordinate space and the same angles between them and, and all this kind of stuff. So all you need to do is is simple set of trigonometric um, lookup tables um, so that you don't have to compute sines and cosines every time, and then just pattern match. It's very, very fast. Um, it used to be the case that it would take uh, approximately 24 hours for an IAFIS check. Um, it can now be done in seconds. For a single search? For a single search, yes. Yeah, that's my understanding. Thank you. Yes, I understand that um, the UK is developing a similar system known as UK Borders. Do you know anything about that? I'm not familiar with the, the UK system. Um, at the moment, my focus on, on UK identity systems is on the UK ID card, which has just entered law and is being deployed now. I'm actually quite glad that I've got my green card and I'm not going to come under it. Um, because um, from what I understand, it's considerably larger scale than US, than the, the, the green card systems, considerably more invasive. Um, from what I understand, it also somehow hooks into the uh, license plate recognition system that is currently being deployed into the United Kingdom, where they're collating data from every CCTV camera that they can possibly get their hands on, feeding it into a number plate recognition system, and tracking. Their, their goal is to track every single car journey that occurs anywhere in the United Kingdom at any time. Um, given that and given the, the overwhelming opposition for ID cards and um, the, the, the fact that the, the UK government is deploying them anyway, it would not surprise me in the slightest to hear that there is a UK equivalent of US visit. Thank you. Yes. Was there a question? Okay. Yes. Where can we get hold of them? Give us a URL. Sorry? Give us a URL. Where can we buy them? Um, <laughs> um, gentleman from Germany pointing out that CCC is now selling um, RFID screens for German passports uh, with uh, RFID tags in them. Um, I'd rather like to know where to get hold of one. Um, yeah, I'll put it up on the screen. Uh, okay. I'm 
Okay, apparently that might be .org. But uh, RFID tag screeners, they're wonderful things. I didn't even know that they, well, I suspected that they existed. People have been wrapping their passports in tinfoil for a large amount of time. Um, it's nice to know that there is actually a commercial effort to sell them. It is, anything is good. Yes? I have a question. It's, there are studies which suggest that the instance of false positives in large populations where you collect fingerprints is very high. Uh, there was a study done in the UK which estimated that on 60 million people, the, the false positive rate of matching would be as in excess of 40%. Now, if you look at the numbers on the US visit, if they estimate 60 million visitors a year to the United States, that means 40% of the fingerprints are not going to match. So you, the more people that visit the United States, the less valuable this is. Yes, or it means that absolutely. the people who are unfortunate enough to get hit get stopped. Absolutely. Um, another thing that, uh, that can be done with US Visit is if the fingerprint does generate a match in APHIS or any other databases, um, they can stop you at the border. Um, they already have your digital photo and they will make you wait at the border while they find the relevant law enforcement officer and get them to actually look at your picture. Um, so if you're ever trying to clear US Visit uh, on entry to the United States and you're stopped for 20 minutes staring at the camera, that's what's going on. I can say from personal experience that if you're unfortunate enough to have flat fingerprints or fingerprints that are not imaged properly, the scanners in the airports don't work. Another very good case for uh, redeploying US Visit under a different uh, persona, should we say. Uh, well, as German coming over here for the first time uh, about three months ago, I thought about the same problem because we don't like to give out our fingerprints. And I have a fingerprint scan at home, uh, done some testing, and on the flight I just realized that I had some very supersized Americans left on the right side from me sitting, so I had to put the fingers under my angles. And this came out that when you come to the fingerprint scanner and you have the, your hands all the time very wet, they are swollen up and this gets you to the point also that it cannot be read correctly. Um, they had problems reading them the first times. I then tried this with my fingerprint at home and after about 30 minutes of fingers under your arms, my fingerprint scan at home was not able to let me access my computer anymore. So, Yes, fingerprint recognition is a very unreliable technology. Um, there's a lot of ways to defeat it, there's a lot of ways to confuse it. Even something as simple as putting up drywall can etch off your fingerprints, at least temporarily. Um, it's, it's really not a reliable biometric identifier. And more importantly, if this information does get leaked, if, if, if someone does figure out a way to decrypt one of these barcodes and retrieve your fingerprints, it's not like a password, you can't change it. You only have ten fingers and they have two of them on the barcode, so, you know, what are you going to do, surgery? Yeah, interesting thing then might be to just f try to let them not scan your fingers on the first entrance because I've never had scanned my fingers after that while I was in the USA. So just at the borders, they'd been scanned. If they don't get a good picture from that, I think that will, well. They, they do make exceptions for physical and mental limitations. So if you're physically unable to get your fingerprints scanned or you're so crazy that you're incapable of keeping your finger on the scanner for long enough for it to recognize it, you may well get away with it. Um, but expect a couple of hours in a small room with a man with a rubber glove um, just to, to verify that you are crazy. But yes, they do make exceptions for, for physical and mental um, abnormalities. Right. And you can be crazy. Read the, in the back of the green volume, you write that you're not crazy, you're not so far out of the... Ah, no, no, no. The, the visa waiver form states that you've never been ruled, um, what is it, mentally incapable by a judge, something like that. But you can still be slightly, slightly not right in the head. <laughs> I think it's, it's if there's, there's ever been a, a legal ruling that you are mentally incompetent, then you may have issues, but I don't actually know what kind of circumstances they would, they would classify mental deficiency as unable to scan your fingerprints. Who knows? If someone braver than me can try it at US immigration. <laughs> yes? 
Uh, earlier on, you mentioned your concerns about the ability to appeal the information that's on the initial card that you fill out. Yes. Uh, the data repositories within the U.S. Visit system should constitute a system of records, and per U.S. Code, you're able to appeal anything that's contained within a system of records maintained by the federal government. Potentially, yes. Um, I believe you can get access to it, um, but um, the, the right of appeal is less about um, how your data is used. It's, more, it's intended as more towards um, giving ultimate authority over the decision to the immigration officer at the desk when you actually cross the border. Yeah, it's not a timely thing, unfortunately. Yes. Um, so as far as Homeland Security is concerned, they're giving authority to the, the desk officers and as a byproduct, removing all of your rights from the rest of the system. Given that you sign away those rights, it would be an interesting court case at best. Well, at minimum, I, would, I should say. Right. Any more questions? Oh, another one. Yes, uh, hello. Um, first of all, I think this is a very important issue, so I'd really like to thank you for bringing that to the forefront for us. I'm uh, someone who, my domestic partner, she's uh, also foreign national, and so as, a, as an American, I'd like to apologize to foreign nationals everywhere. This is a complete travesty and a, a representation of, of the worst kind of xenophobia that we've experienced in a long time. Um, my, back to my question, actually. My first question is, um, has any been work been done, or do we know of any projects to decode or decrypt the information in the barcodes on the, on the receipts? I've put in a, a reasonable amount of time on my own. Um, I don't know if, if anyone here saw Dan Kaminsky's Black Hat presentation. Um, he's presenting it again tomorrow, I believe, about um, uh, figuring out protocols using nothing but captures of the protocols. Um, he and I worked together for a, a fair amount of time on this, and, and well, we didn't actually get anything productive out of it. Um, the mo at the moment, all I'm left with is um, inconsistent block sizes that mean it's, it's not any commonly used encryption algorithm that's certainly that's NIST approved. Um, and it looks random. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't actually come under US visit anymore, so I can't collect any more of these barcodes. And given the amount of information that I've just told everyone is on them, I doubt there's very many people that would give me any. Um, if there are any volunteers in the audience, I would absolutely love to, to, to get any of these receipts that you have. Um, you have my assurance, if that's worth anything, that I won't do anything bad with it. Um, but given that I'm currently on stage at DEF CON, you may not believe me. <laughs> uh, I have a second question. That is, um, what's the prognosis or, or, or the direction that you're going down the road for more research on US visit or, or more activities re regarding that? Well, the most productive avenue would probably be a, a Freedom, of Freedom of Information Act request. Um, FOIA with Homeland Security historically is not very successful, so um, I don't know if there's any, le any lawyers out there that would be interested in, in filing any lawsuits to try and get more information about the system. In the absence of, of legal recourse, I, I'll be focusing on the barcodes. Um, as soon as I can get my hands on some more samples, I can do a bit more in-depth statistical analysis of them, possibly get some more data. I don't really know. It's, it's very much up in the air. Um, we're, we're pretty much stonewalled at this point. Yes. Okay. Um, I read a couple weeks ago in the Federal Register and on CNN that if U.S. Visit has their way, as a green card holder, you actually will be part of U.S. Visit again. Yes. So. I would expect so. <laughs> they, they, um, are, they are moving toward doing that. Just. Well, it's like I say, it's, it's a <laughs> land grab from Homeland Security. Um, they've had such success, or rather lack of problems, um, deploying US Visit as widely as it has been so far. It would not surprise me at all to hear that they're de planning to deploy it to green card holders and eventually to US citizens as well. Wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, I noticed because uh, I travel quite a lot, I am based on being older and I travel to the Europe quite a lot. Um, I've noticed that certain airports in the US do not have US visit uh, boxes. Do you know what the situation is with regards to uh, whether I'm legally required to do the answer? You are legally required to use the system if it is present. 
Um, alternatively, um, the way that they would find out that you haven't used the system is when you try and get on the plane, you don't have the receipt and you'll be denied boarding. Um, what, you, what you've just described is how the system was deployed. Um, at first, it was deployed at a few key airports around the United States, Seattle, San Francisco, a um, couple of others. Um, they were used as test beds for, for you know, validating the technology, making sure that it worked, and it's in the process of being deployed everywhere. So expect to see it at every airport pretty soon. Any more questions? Fabulous. Let's get beer then. Um,